Welcome everybody. Uh, thank you guys. No, my name is Robin Thompson and I'm organising these talks. And this week we have, or this month, we have Helen, who has come all the way from Froome. Um, Helen is a composer and an installation artist. And in 1999, with art administrator Steve Elisha, she formed Art Music, who create and produce site-specific participatory collaborative art. As a composer, she has been commissioned by the BBC, Salisbury Festival and the Inside Out Dorset Festival. Her work is often inspired by water and landscape. And Helen and I collaborated on a very large scale public art project called Purse Intrusions uh, in Wells over 2000, well, between 2007 and 2008. And if you go to www.palaceintrusions.org.uk, there's still a website with all that work still there. So I'll hand it over to you then. Okay. Um, first thing to say is that this talk started life as part of a double act with Melanie. We both did a talk about our watery work um, and it was called Bodies of Water. So I'm, I'm particularly pleased that she wanted me to come and do the talk. So, and I hope you don't mind, I'm going to read because it will be much better if I read. <laughs> It'll be what I want to say. <laughs> um, so, across the world, ceremony and ritual are central to the way in which we engage with death. The requiem, or I should have said, this is called a new kind of requiem, this talk. So the Requiem, though originating in the Catholic Church, continues to develop in the hands of composers and other artists, becoming increasingly abstracted, secularised and universally accessible. My name is Helen Ottaway. I'm a composer and sound artist who, over the years, has repeatedly found herself working alongside other art forms, particularly theatre, dance, performance art and visual art, and also collaborating with other artists. These interactions with other disciplines and my two encounters with composer and thinker John Cage have influenced the way I plan, compose and place my music. I rarely think in terms of pure music for the concert hall. I think of my music as site specific or site responsive. It's important to me where the sounds and music have come from and what their relationship is with the environment. My mother died a few years ago. I'm a certain age. This is happening to my friends too. We're becoming orphans. We are now the older generation. What happens next? Do I go on just the same? Does this change me as a person or as an artist? Does my new situation even have anything to do with my work in practice? Well, actually, yes, it seems that it does. My working life experienced a long pause while I looked after my mother in her final year. I don't begrudge it at all. I valued the time spent together, even when, when she was quite ill. When she died in March 2017, I experienced grief and I missed her. But her death also released me back into my working practice and I was finally able to accept an opportunity offered twice before to take part in the Suramadura International Artist Residency. The residency took place in Sri Lanka where on Boxing Day in 2004 the people suffered catastrophic losses as a result of the Indian Ocean tsunami. With my recent personal bereavement as well, I decided that my residency would focus on loss, absence and memory. My idea was to start to compose a new kind of requiem, a site-specific work combining live choral music with sound installation and outdoor performance. My aim while in Sri Lanka was to create sketches and miniatures pieces which could stand alone, but also be the starting point for the larger work I was planning. I, know, I knew that there would be no piano where we were staying and that I'd have to find other ways of writing music. Several years ago, I bought on a whim 
a little musical box mechanism, the kind that plays by winding a strip of punched paper through it. I decided on the basis of its simplicity and its size that this would be my ideal travelling composing machine, so I packed it along with my handheld sound recorder, a couple of hydrophones and some tiny battery powered loudspeakers. I spent my time in Sri Lanka talking to local people and recording their memories, making field recordings of nearby locations and nature and punching paper strips to make tunes for my musical box. I found the activity of sitting and punching patterns of holes in the paper strips gave me time to think and reflect. I commissioned a long box with soundboard for the mechanism from Nalinda, the woodcarver across the road. The result was this beautiful musical box. This is the same, I'll show you, I think I'll show it to you in more detail. So it's a long box, but this is a new mechanism like the other one which has a bit of a story. Um, a little while ago, this one started to give up the ghost and, and started creaking and sticking, making funny noises. Um, and I remembered that a French um, musical box manufacturer had told me that this one was a bit cheap and basic and that it wouldn't last. And he was quite right. So he had supplied me with a better one, which is this one, and, um, and with the help of Steve here, um, we had to take that one out and put this one in, which involved a bit of sawing and surgery. So, um, but the new one is in now and it's, it's quite a lot smoother. It's quite surprising that musical, box have such a, musical boxes have such character. So this one was a bit rough. This one is a bit smooth. They're both nice. Um, so I'd like to play you the five tunes I wrote in Sri Lanka and I'll tell you a bit about them. I gave them the collective title of Wave Songs. And so these are the strips of paper. So the first one, in honour of my mother, um, start with I made a wave pattern at the bottom. You have to remember that I was doing this I'm doing this kind of blind in a way, and I can't tell what it's going to sound like. And at the beginning, I also didn't know that I could correct mistakes. So, so I was thinking, each hole I punch, this has got to be absolutely right. So it was a bit painful to start with. Then I found out that you can actually get a bit of masking tape and stick it on the back and stick the hole back in. So I started to relax. But so you've got the waves at the bottom, and then above the waves, I put uh, one of my mother's favourite songs, Blow the Wind Southerly, just the first bit of it. So. Sounds nice if the music box is slightly open. So a couple of door stops do the trick. So this one is called Blow the Wind. And what's lovely about this box is that it's exactly the right length for the piece of music just to drop into the box after it's played. Mm -hmm. Sounds wonderful. <laughs> so the second one I wrote is called The Fisherman's Song. I had been by the sea and um, caught the fishermen pulling in their nets. They were just at the end of doing this and I did have a sense that 
that they sang when they did this, and I heard just the very end of their song. It's a bit frustrating because I would have liked to have heard all of it, but the little bit I heard formed the basis for this fisherman's song. Can I ask? Um, yeah. How do you know what notes are going to be played? Is this? Ah, uh, well, child. we've got a treble clef and a bass clef there, so oh, it's actually you're punching the you're punching the holes on what is a traditional musical stave. Okay. Um, when it actually goes through, it, it sort of doesn't bear any relation to that in a way, but but the, the notes are arranged like the like a, okay. like a scale. Okay. So this is the fisherman's song. it's hand wound because you can slow down at the end of a piece it's not it's not kind of pulling itself along electronically um, so it gives you more control this piece is called drawing waves and what mm. I did was I drew waves you can see clearer on the back in a way because you don't have the blue um, I wanted just to see what it would sound like if I played the visualisation of what looked like waves through the musical box. So I had no idea when I first played this what it would sound like. I think it does have a sense, a little bit of a sense of the tumble of water, um, but it's quite abstract in a way. I noticed um, where I was, I was in a hotel with the sea on one side and the road on the other side and next to the road was the railway line and there just seemed to be lines everywhere um, and I have a little bit of a history of um, being involved in minimalist music so I thought I would sort of revert to type and, and make a little systems piece based on layering up lines so this one, this one is called Drawing Lines
this one really, I called the whole set wave songs, even though they're not sung, but this one was sung. This one is called The Corridor Song, and I wrote it for two of the other artists and myself to sing in the corridor. I don't know whether knowing that it will sound vocal to you or not, but um, imagine this one sung. So they, each of those took me quite a long time because it's one, one hole at a time and trying to get it right. And I did only have to use about five bits of masking tape in the end. <laughs> so, um, onward. So another piece of work that I made during my residency was a performance I called Drawing in the Sand. I was looking for a way of illustrating the transient nature of life and also of sound. At the same time, I wanted to reflect something of the human instinct to survive and the drive to keep going in difficult times. This sense of keeping going was especially noticeable on the southwest coast of Sri Lanka, where the people have no real alternative to living on the coast, but to live with the constant fear of another tsunami. My performance consisted of drawing musical staves in the sand with a rake that I had customised, and then with a branch sharpened to a pencil-like point, I attempted to write a tune in the sand before the waves washed over it and erased it. In the autumn, on that beach, the tide hardly moves and is always very close to the shore, leaving only a short bit of sand exposed. Once or twice, I managed to write a whole line of my tune, but it was never very long before it was washed away. I enjoyed stepping outside my usual practice to perform this durational piece. It seemed like an important thing to do, to introduce new ways of working, particularly this physical performance with the element of endurance. Both the hole punching and the sand drawing were new kinds of activities for me. One of the great gifts of the residency was time, the musical box tunes and the sound, sound drawing are examples of me finding new ways of using time in the production and performance of my work. I mentioned the sound of the waves earlier. We were staying in Hikadua in a hotel wedged between the sea and the main southwest coast road from Colombo to Gaul. The sound of the waves was very loud and constant, no gentle lapping but the full force of the crashing surf. On the other side, the road, with its careering buses and floating tuk-tuks, was equally noisy and almost equally constant. Beyond the road, in the jungle, you were surrounded by another rich sound world. Birds squawking, monkeys calling, dogs barking, trains hooting, and more tuk-tuks tooting. The most peaceful place I experienced was the inland lagoon, calm waters gently stirred by the oars of our boat. I wanted to capture this clash of sound worlds that was my constant companion, and so I made a sound installation to be placed in the corridor which linked the sea and the road. This way, the sound installation was partly an, in, partly an enhancement of the real sounds. In that first demonstration, I wanted it to be hard to tell what was real and what wasn't. I overlaid the environmental sounds with snatches of interviews with local people and fellow artists, stories of loss and survival, with water and the sea a continuing theme. 
The sea, sounds, the sea soundscape featured the voice of fellow artist Kaina Hodges, who talks about being at the beach when she heard that someone very close to her had died. The opposing soundscape features extracts from an interview I conducted with the assistant manager of the Tsunami Museum in <coughs> Peralia. She tells of her flight inland from the tsunami with her two children. The sound of water pervades both soundscapes. Other sounds, bells, traffic, horns, and fragments of the music I'd been writing during the residency drift in and out. I placed my tiny loudspeakers, one either end of the corridor, facing each other. The effect was an immersive enhancement of the existing oral environment, a feeling of being submerged in a heightened and narrated version of the sound worlds of the sea, the road, and the jungle. The piece will never have exactly the same effect as when played in the original location, with the confusion between reality and artifice. But I've been very interested in how it sounded in different situations. At the end of my time in Sri Lanka, I had the opportunity to install the piece as part of the first international festival of human rights in Colombo. It was placed in a staircase between two galleries with one speaker at the bottom and one at the top. As people walked from one floor to the other, they passed through the uprooted sound world of Hikadua and were temporarily immersed. Since I've been back in the UK, I've also given demonstrations in offices, houses, barns and galleries. Each new location lends the piece a different feel, making it as much about where we are now as where I was when I created it. So I'm going to play you this sound installation now. I just have to set it up. And you'll have the sea behind you and the jungle in front of you. It lasts for about 10 minutes. And you might like to shut your eyes and just become submerged. came hit, I have felt, my son also felt. But I am also go down, catch my son under the water.
every year on the day of her death, I go to the beach. It's where I was when she died.
to detract from what came out of them, but their frequency response is extraordinary to things. So They're made so. by um, creative, creative, yes, creative music. They don't make them anymore, but actually they're quite a lot like that around, and okay. they're good. Well, so, um, that was a lovely piece. Thank you. thank you. Much of my previous work has been created in a sense, created, so I'll start that bit again. Much of my previous work has been created in response to a sense of place, urban and rural landscapes, buildings and bodies of water, and themes of loss and memory have also appeared repeatedly, and strangely, I've only recently realised that this is the case. For the most part, my references to loss and grief have been remote, second-hand, historical, or based in mythology, for instance, Art Music's installation Lacrimae reimagines the story from Ovid's Metamorphosis of Phaeton's sisters lamenting and weeping for their brother. The Opera Room memorialised the tradition of summer opera making at Shawford Mill over several decades, a tradition now long gone. And the year-long project In the Field was created to mark the centenary of a particular battle in the First World War where 25 young men from Wadhurst in Sussex lost their lives in one morning. Even back in the 1990s, working with the group Three or Four Composers, we were making work inspired by the disappearance under the sea of the bells of the 55 churches of Dunwich in Suffolk. The work I did in Sri Lanka was the first time I chose to develop musical and performance ideas in response to the life and death of an actual person close to me. Since my mother died now five years ago, I've lost friends and colleagues as well. And so hints of these others are now seeping into the work. A new much longer piece for Musical Box and Voice written in 2019 includes references to an old friend who died the Christmas before. That piece called Wind and Unwind was commissioned by Activate Performing Arts and Inside Out Dorset Festival to be performed under the moon in Luke Jerome's Museum of the Moon, which in that summer was installed in Sherbourne Abbey. I devised a musical box score for this musical box that was 15 metres in length and combined it with a setting for voice of Thomas Hardy's grief and guilt-ridden poem in the moonlight. As the paper strip played out through the machine, it rolled out of the other end and down the nave it went all the way down the aisle, reaching nearly from the crossing to the back of the nave. I thought of it as a life unwinding through music and song, all like the shadow of a moonbeam reflected across the floor. The same year, I was invited to deliver this talk at the 14th International Conference on the Social Context of Death, Dying and Disposal at Bath University. It was a real gathering of academics and practitioners all of whom had a different perspective or a different approach to death. I learned to study and draw a skull. I listened to renowned forensic anthropologist Sue Black talking about her work deciphering the aftermath of the war in Kosovo. One of the most fascinating people I met was a choreographer from Boston called Karen Krolak, who as a result of losing her three closest family members in a road accident, had started to assemble the Dictionary of Negative Space. She had noticed that very often, and when you most need them, the words for what you were experiencing when grieving for loved ones simply do not exist. Her dictionary was full of absences, numbers standing in for words we need but do not have. We have some, widow, orphan, but where are the words for someone who's lost a sibling or a child? Those and hundreds of other words seem to be missing. 
numbers representing missing words are cross-referenced with other numbers, standing in for more nameless feelings and experiences. Talking to Karen and reading the dictionary led me to realise that I too had been dealing with negative space, making holes in the paper strips to play through the musical box. I was creating absences, notating losses. The sketches, the installation, the performance on the beach, wind and unwind, are all points on my way to my new kind of requiem. I'm about to start on the next stage, which involves collaborating with the poet Rosie Jackson. My work on this project so far has been unusually solitary. I did have the help and support of my fellow artists in Sri Lanka, but most of what I've done, I've done alone. I am naturally a collaborator, and although this solo period has been illuminating and empowering, I'm really looking forward to working with another artist on the next stage. I think of this work as a journey, both in the writing and the eventual performance. The route and the destination are gradually becoming clearer. The process seems quite different from the usual business of writing music. And just like grief, it seems to take its time. As I've described, the death of my mother was a major catalyst for this work. Personal bereavement is, I think, a common trigger for writing a requiem. I always thought of what I was doing as having a wider, more universal theme as well, hence the focus on the Indian Ocean tsunami, to which now we can add countless natural and man-made disasters which have resulted in horrendous suffering and loss of life. In the five years since I first delivered this talk, I also feel other overwhelming losses much more strongly. Loss of species, loss of, loss of um, the environment, erosion of human rights and democracy. These losses somehow dwarf our personal ones. I don't really know how to address these massive issues in my creative work, but I have faith in the process and hope that when the new kind of requiem is created, and hopefully I'll also think of a new way of describing it, it will be relevant and meaningful. Activate Performing Arts and the Festival Inside Out Dorset have been a major source of support throughout this whole process, including sponsoring my participation in the residency in Sri Lanka. They've now also formally commissioned the Requiem for the Inside Out Dorset Festival in September 2023, it will take place in a currently unrevealed location in rural Dorset. And I'll be documenting the whole process on my blog. And on my blog, you can also find the whole illustrated story of Sri Lanka and the musical box with pictures. Um, I've left my calling cards on your chairs, so um, you can find my blog on there. I'd like to finish by playing you one of the five musical box pieces again in a different way. It's one of the unforeseen consequences of this way of writing music, punching holes in strips of paper, that you end up with four different ways to perform each piece. Forwards, backwards, upside down, or upside down backwards. Now I really enjoy the accidental in art, so I'm going to play you a corridor song. upside down and backwards. <laughs> Thank you. 
Mm. I really love the way that one suddenly acquires a kind of syncopation that it didn't have the other way around. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Helen on behalf of Heart of the Tribe Gallery and this is a chance for you to ask, which you have already stopped doing, uh, those questions that you uh, might have come up while you were listening to this uh, extraordinary talk. It's great to hear it again. Any questions, anything really that, you know, popped in? Yeah, I, I'd like to ask how, how does the amplification work? From the musical box? Is it just well, that's the magic. It's, it's just like, no, it's just like any other instrument that has a sound box, you know, like a guitar, um, the reason that, that you hear the strings is because it's it's being amplified through the, the space in the wood. Yeah. So this, when I played this on its own, or this one, on its own, it's what I can demonstrate, actually. It's, it's a tiny sound. Yeah. So, what I just played was, I might need a hand. <laughs> Sorry. Could you? No, no, it's 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 <laughs> worth demonstrating. Can you just push that? Just push it in. Thanks. Okay. Yes. So this is how tiny it is. This is the piece I just played. So I mean, you can be just about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm expecting. And you can just about hear it. But you know, especially being by the sea, and mm -hmm. that that sea was really loud. Yeah. There's just no way. Mm -hmm. And um, so we did have the internet in Sri Lanka. So I got on the internet and and found people who'd made boxes. And, um, and I, it really appealed to me, the idea of a box that the, that the strips could kind of mm. fall into mm. at the end. Mm. And also, you know, there, the, there's a lovely woodworking tradition. So this, this has on the top of it, it has this lovely wave pattern. Yeah. You can see that. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and also a kind of um, spiral yeah. here. And um, he'd never been asked to do anything like this before. He usually made you know, figures for tourists. And um, so I think he decided he never wanted to make a box for anyone again. <laughs> but, um, Was it meant to look like a coffin? No, not really. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's funny that it's a Another of those unintended consequences. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a little bit long for a coffin. Yeah. It'd be a great idea for a coffin, wouldn't it, Harry? <laughs> <laughs> it could be fake. It could be fake. It's not going to be a bit creepy. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's, it's, and we did try out. You can, they're very, depending on the acoustics of the place you're playing it, sometimes I have it right open. Sometimes I'd have it closed, but it seemed nice and it seemed to resonate nicely a little bit open. Just like you would with a piano, really. You'd sometimes have the lid lid open a bit or a lot or not open. So, yeah, it's... It's a beautiful sound. It's a lovely sound. Mm. Very gentle. What you heard on the installation was, um, was this one. And I don't know if you could tell, it's a little less smooth. This one is very smooth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the punch cards are fascinating to me because I am was a machine and I don't know, you know, this machine cards, mm -hmm. yeah. so like that separate, like a different dimension. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, I was always punching the wrong hole and sticking to it. So, so, so you knew that technique already. <laughs> Yeah, and it's quite yeah. hard on your, I mean, I don't know if you're doing it manually, it's quite hard yeah, on your hands. Do you want to explain how the 15 metre Oh, the 15, yeah, unfortunately, so I couldn't put it with me. No, the, the 15 metre one, I wanted to make a really long one. And um, so it sort of sits in a box down here and I feed it in 
Right. And it and it goes right through and then out the other end. Um, but I didn't think I could hand punch, and anyway, I couldn't get a piece of paper long enough. So there's a the company in France that also supplied this new mechanism. They they do it um, from a MIDI file. So you send a MIDI file, and they you wouldn't imagine, would you, that there are companies out there punching long <laughs> musical <laughs> box pieces, but they have a machine yeah. that does it. So then I got in the post. Right. A, a lovely right. roll of punched paper. Wonderful. The original computers were about like that, weren't they? Mm. 1970. Yeah. I yeah. had to punch a hundred cards to write your name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's um it's been a real discovery and, and just based on you know, I needed something small. Mm. Um so how can, how did you put together the installation? Um, I mean, presumably several separate recordings. Yes. Do you have a DAW mixing desk? No, I I have my computer and Audacity, which is a free. Oh, okay. Yes. You know Audacity. Uh, it's yes. a free, um, very usable um, program. So, what I really love about these programs on computers is that it's also visual. Mm. You know, you can see, you can actually see. I also do a radio program and sometimes I do the editing for for when it's going to be on listen again and I can see my arms I know what my arms look like and so I could cut out my arms without listening to it and um, it is amazing it's it's made this kind of thing you know possible for someone like me who's not a sort of trained technician and so it was quite a lot of trial and error um, there was one, um, so I, I had my handheld recorder, my Zoom, which is also a brilliant thing, quite small. Um, so I just recorded whatever I could and, and sat in my room on my computer, kind of cutting bits up and putting them together again. And so it's quite, it's quite roughly made. I mean, you can pr probably... You can hear some rough edges, but but it was my first my first ever attempt at doing anything like that. So um, so I was well, quite. My first ever attempt. <laughs> I think it's pretty damn good. I'd watched somebody else doing it quite a lot. Mm. I worked with a sound designer called Alistair Goulden for art music projects, and he always does the technical side. So I'm often sitting next to him, with you know a great big screen of mm. bits of music in different places. So I had a bit of an idea, but um, no, it's some of these things. And I took, I took a couple of hydrophones so we could record under the water, mm. one of which gave up the ghost quite soon. So I only had a single hydrophone, but I still got some, the kind of bubbly sounds that you heard from the back, they were, they were recorded with the hydrophone. Mm. Um, I just, you know, took my Zoom with me everywhere and recorded people and sounds and the mm. the street sounds that was that was in the market. I just carried my walked around walked walk. around with mm. it and then the the music was on a bus. They the buses in Sri Lanka are incredible. They go really fast and and they're like a moving party and they have sound system and they're playing playing music yeah. and blaring their horn and um it's so much better than the number 43 absolutely <laughs> it's really it's great fun yeah. so the the music it just happened there was that nice you know quite a nice yeah. bit of music playing along with all the tooting and the hooting mm -hmm. so is this picture of you playing <laughs> is that the underwater recording no that's um that's a piece of driftwood one of my, my one of my fellow artists is a great maker, and um, she picked up on this, you know, me away from home without a piano, and decided to make me a piano out of mm. driftwood. So she got this bit of wood and she painted it very, very successfully. It's very convincing. Mm. And then um, we got in the sea and she took seventy photos. So. <laughs> So I have countless photos of me with the with the driftwood keyboard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
but that was that was a really nice that was a really nice outcome. You know, again, kind of quite unexpected, mm. and she was very generous to make this thing mm. for me. Mm. I think it's still there. <laughs> <laughs> so there's tea and cake outside. Mm. So yeah. we can continue this informally if you wish. I um, have brought I've brought some CDs with me if anybody is interested in purchasing CDs, I'm going to give, if anybody does purchase anything, I'm going to give um, the proceeds to Ukraine. So, um, so I'll get those out. Thank um, you so much, Helen. Thank you. <laughs>